it's actually a, a bovine herpes virus, um, similar family to viruses that, that cause cold sores in humans. Um, and a virus that is associated with both respiratory disease, as you'd expect, rhinotracheitis, but also can cause fertility problems in adult cattle, can cause early embryonic death and, and abortions as a result of infection. Interesting virus, because a bit like cold sores, can actually, once a cow's become infected, it can go off and, and lie latent, hide away in the, the nervous tissue, and actually come back out and cause disease again or allow itself to spread onto other cows later in life. In humans, the common one is herpes simplex virus, the one that call, causes cold sores in humans. And IBR virus is, is similar to that in some ways. Uh, humans kiss more than cattle do, and so consequently the virus is developed this way of producing cold sores, so you can spread it on reason, reasonably quickly. Cattle don't kiss as much, and so they have to produce it in clouds of, of spittle and dribble and um, nasal secretions like that. It lies dormant in the nervous system of the cows, they can carry it for weeks, months, years. And then under a period of stress, just like in cold sores in people, so when they're, they're under more pressure, uh, under more stress, then these viruses uh, come out of the nervous system, start replicating, start reproducing, multiplying, and cause these clinical diseases in, in cattle. So the periods of stress are uh, housing, uh, calving, uh, change of farm, change of social group, so buying in stock, so you might buy in stock that uh, are carrying IBI virus, they arrive on a new farm, they start to shed that virus because they're under pressure, they're in a new environment, a bit like mixing children at school I guess, you're mixing these, these, these new cows together, this increases the pressure on the animals, their immune system can't cope with this level of virus in the, in the animal, can't keep it damped down so to speak, and they start to then shed this virus. But it's those stressful events and you know, that word stress, that, that something moving cows onto a new premises, going and buying cows and actually bringing cows in, um, they may be bringing the virus or actually what they may be being mixed in with the, the rest of the herd be enough of a stressful event to cause a, a flare up as it were in a, a cow that's latently infected, persistently infected to start to shed virus and then for that to spread and cause disease in, in other stock on the farm. It's a very infectious virus so you get a lot of animals infected all at once in a very short period and it can infect any age of cattle. Usually it uh, is more common amongst stock which have been bought in or stock which have been infected uh, from a neighboring farm or something like that. And uh, it's a severe respiratory infection. They'll be coughing, as I said, a lot of discharge and very depressed. A lot of them animals will be quite sick, but usually only for a short time, uh, 10 days at the most. Occasional ones will die, they'll get much more severe disease and they'll die. And if you're in a dairy herd, there'll be a very marked milk drop, a uh, lot of loss of, of milk production. And it'll take about two to three weeks to go right through the farm. And it'll take a little bit longer than that for all the animals to, to recover. And beef animals will lose a lot of condition because they are quite sick, nasty disease. So classically what IBR has done before is entered a naive, uh, unprotected herd and caused a massive amount of uh, respiratory disease, namely nasal discharge, um, ocular discharge, very, very high temperatures um, and also quite pronounced milk drop. But what we also are aware of is its reproductive issues as well. We know it can cause abortion, um, which obviously plays a major role in the production in dairy and beef herds. Before 1976, there was very little IBR in the country at all. We imported a new virus, a new hot strain of virus from America in 1977, something like that. And really throughout the 70s and 80s, the late 70s and 80s, it spread throughout the country, causing very severe diseases in a very naive population. All the animals were completely susceptible to the virus and we got a much more severe disease. So that was really the start of the change of it. When, when I was at university in the early 1990s, I used to come see practice here in Cheshire and we used to see standing sheds like this and we classically used to talk about IBR, that you'd have one cow with a discharging eyes and a discharging nose in the morning, you'd have three or four by lunchtime, you'd have a dozen by tea time. that's how we used to see it. And then when I qualified and started working here in the early 90s, um, we sometimes used to see the one or two very sick cows, often where you get that cow over the initial stage of the disease, you get a temperature down, you get her eating again, but the, the effect on her was 
so so big that it affected the airways and her breathing that she just gradually lose weight and fade away and you often end up culling that animal after a month or two and, and often nothing else in the herd was affected and yet it seems to have gone full circle now we'll get one or two cows perhaps a, a bit poorly uh, showing a few clinical signs and then the rest of the herd uh, a, a low grade level as well most important thing is to get a quick diagnosis. If you've got a, animals, a group of animals which have suddenly started coughing, nasal discharge, very red eyes, get onto your vet immediately because he can come along and he can actually vaccinate uh, other animals on the farm to prevent them getting infection. There's not many diseases you can actually use a vaccine to prevent spread of infection even after the infection's arrived. So that's a live intranasal vaccine and that will help to reduce the amount of infection and the amount of disease that you see during an initial stage of infection. So that's the first thing to do. Um, and also antibiotic cover of animals which have got the disease will also help to shorten the length, the length span of the disease. But really the main way of preventing a disease is using the vaccines. Long-term control has to be through a vaccination program. Um, and actually vaccinating animals to, to get immunity within the herd. Um, or if you, you're free of IBR, which of course many farms will want to be because of the export implications potentially, and the trade implications, is actually to make sure that you've got sufficient biosecurity to reduce the risk of introducing the disease. So by making sure that you buy from accredited stock, from accredited herds, testing animals that, that perhaps you bring in and, and ensuring that you maintain a closed herd. Monitoring your bolt milk antibody levels for IBR is a, is an easy way of, of just keeping a monitor on the situation. I, I've got several farms where we take a sample every quarter. The live vaccine, as I said, is the one that you would want to use in the face of an outbreak, and that seems to work well. When you're using them as preventative vaccines, again, it'll depend on what age of animal you're trying to protect. So very young calves, you may want to use a live vaccine to start with intranasally um, and then continue the course uh, later on with, with other vaccines as they get older, up to like 12 weeks, something like that. In terms of the vaccines, there are then, it's quite an interesting area in that there have been developments of marker vaccines, which actually mean that you've got the ability to be able to differentiate between animals that have got immunity because they've been vaccinated and animals that have got immunity because they've been exposed to disease. Uh, on the market also within those marker vaccines are uh, live and inactivated vaccines and, and live vaccines should be targeted against animals that are naive or unprotected um, in any way from the disease. Uh, they're better at preventing clinical disease the first time that animal is infected whereas the inactivated vaccines are much better at reducing the impact of latent or dormantly infected animals within a herd. So generally we split it into young and adult stock Generally, adult stock within a beef or dairy herd may have had the disease before, become latently infected, and they will benefit more from inactivated vaccines than live vaccines. Live vaccines really have their niche in young stock where they haven't had that disease before and they're obviously naive to that disease. They may come in contact from a bought in animal or from within the herd, an animal shedding uh, reactivated virus. The live vaccines are best at preventing actual disease, whereas the killed vaccines are actually better at stimulating a higher level of antibody and therefore preventing um, spread of the virus in an, in an endemically infected herd. We have now what we call marker vaccines, which are very good because if you do want to eventually eradicate the virus from your herd, then you can gradually eliminate those animals which have had a natural infection from those which have only been vaccinated. And so you can gradually reduce the number of naturally infected animals in the herd. The two marker vaccines um, on the market are uh, Risperval IBR marker live and Risperval IBR marker inactivated. The, the live vaccine is very much uh, targeted at naive animals which aren't infected with the disease. Whereas the inactivated vaccine reduces the impact of these latently infected animals within a herd. So a herd that has a lot of latently infected animals may want to think about using an inactivated vaccine as a better control measure against IBR as opposed to a live vaccine which have been classically used in the past. There is no national control scheme at all for IBR in this country. A lot of countries have already done a lot more about IBR than we have. Uh, so a lot of the Scandinavian countries are free. Um, 
Germany has, uh, has a program, uh, some areas of France have programs, Italy, north of Italy has a program, uh, Switzerland is free, Austria is free, and so we really are going to have to catch up with this one because to export any of your animals into Europe at all or to trade them, they will need, you will need to be able to show that they are free of IBR antibody.